Hello, I am Kevin Roundy, and I'm here to talk to you today about research we've done at Norton LifeLock with Cornell and New York universities. Before I begin, I'd like to warn you that this talk deals with how technology enables intimate partner violence, which is a very important topic, but also one that can be very difficult to listen to. Intimate partner violence is a pervasive problem that has been experienced by a third of women and a sixth of men in the United States. Digging deeper into one manifestation of abusive behavior among romantic partners, a February 2020 survey by Norton LifeLock found that 46% of U.S. adults admitted to stalking a current or former romantic partner, and that 10% of these people admitted to using a mobile app to help them monitor SMS, phone calls, emails, or photos. Researchers have identified many ways in which technology enables intimate partner violence, finding that it is used for harassment, spying, account hacking, and fake revenge porn. However, other than a recent study of intimate partner spyware, there have been very few systematic investigations into the ecosystem of apps that enable these kinds of abusive behavior. The goal of our study is to explore what we call creepware, apps that enable abusive behavior, effectively helping people to behave like creeps. To this end, we conducted a measurement study. Its goal is to discover and understand the types of creepware that are being used in practice. We'll proceed by first presenting background research and data sets that motivate and enable this work. Next, we describe the customized graph algorithm we created to measure and find prevalent creepware. Third, we describe the taxonomy we created to characterize the creepware ecosystem, and we provide representative examples of what we found. We conclude by discussing progress we've made towards addressing the creepware problem and open challenges that still need to be addressed. Our measurement study seeks to answer the following question. What kinds of apps are most likely to appear on devices infected by intimate partner spyware? We set about to design an algorithm to answer this question. Accordingly, we built on a 2018 study that systematically identified the spyware used in intimate partner violence. They identified candidate spyware apps by searching for mobile apps that advertised under such search terms as catch my cheating girlfriend. This surfaced a large number of candidate apps, some of which they manually labeled. Next, they engineered a feature set around the available app metadata that they had for these apps, which they used to train a classifier. Since our goal was to capture a broader ecosystem of abusive apps, we turned to complementary techniques that do not use descriptive features at all, instead relying on the simple insight of guilt by association. This can be described as the thought that birds of a feather flock together. And prior work has shown that installation relationships do indeed identify clusters of malicious software and clusters of benign software. These approaches are flexible and can work really well even with very small amounts of labeled data, which is what we have in our situation. To apply the concept of guilt by association in our setting, we selected a set of creeper apps known to have advertised for use as intimate partner surveillance tools. To identify additional creepware apps, we examine the devices on which these apps are installed to see what other apps tend to be installed alongside them. We became optimistic that this approach would provide additional insights when exploratory investigations confirmed that devices infected by intimate partner surveillance apps often have many additional creepware apps on, installed on them as well. Here you can see a real device on which mSpy has been installed, which tracks all sorts of different things, but you can also see location tracking apps, auto call recorders, and SMS forwarding apps. The first data set on which we sought to apply the guilt by association principle was anonymized app installation data from the year 2017. For each device, we had a list of installed application identifiers. From this, we constructed a bipartite graph between 27 million devices, nearly 11 million apps, and the edges in the network represent nearly 4 billion app installations. 18 of these apps were designated as apps known to be used for intimate partner surveillance. We similarly applied this algorithm to data from May 2018 to May 2019, and which produced similar results. We call our algorithm CreepRank because it ranks candidate creepware applications. It takes as input a list of the apps installed on customer devices, which it represents as a bipartite graph after scrubbing it to remove devices that do not seem indicative of normal use. It also tags 18 apps as known bad intimate partner surveillance applications. This labeled graph serves as the input to CreepRank, which is implemented as a distributed Spark Scala job that runs for 24 minutes until it converges, which happens after 10 rounds. The output is a ranked list of the applications that are disproportionately likely to be installed alongside known intimate partner surveillance apps. 
To highlight the intuition behind the Creepware algorithm, we'll use this small graph of app installation data. AppM is known Creepware, and we seek to score apps N and O based on how likely they are to be installed on devices infected by Creepware. A natural way to score AppN is to consider that it's installed on two devices, one of which is infected by Creepware, and assign it a score of 0.5, while AppO gets a score of 0. This isn't a great outcome, however, as AppO does have an indirect relationship to AppM that we'd like to capture, so we implemented CreepRank as an iterative algorithm. Effectively, we assign devices an infection score based on the maximum score of any app installed on the device in the previous round, and we assigned app scores based on the average score of the devices on which they're installed. This algorithm converges quickly in practice, and it captures high-order correlations nicely. We're not yet done, however, as this algorithm still has a significant problem that leads to poor results. To see it, consider the small graph with apps P and Q. Our data set contains millions of rare apps like app Q that could appear on a device that happens to be infected with creepware by random chance. If we contrast app Q to app S, which we have seen on 20 devices, 14 of which are infected with creepware, this should give us greater confidence that app S is associated with creepware. Unfortunately, AppQ is currently receiving a higher score, which is not what we want. To address this problem, we turn to maximum a posteriori probability estimation, which allows us to incorporate a prior belief that most apps are not creepware related with the evidence provided by app installation data into a posterior probability distribution. We estimated the base rate of creepware at 5 and 10,000, which serves as our prior belief. Then using the map method, we arrive at the following formula for the posterior distribution which divides the number of times an app appears on infected devices by the total number of instances of the app while adding a large constant to the denominator. This constant effectively indicates that we need to see several instances of an app alongside creepware before we will begin to believe that it is likely to be creepware related itself. In the case of apps Q and S, this method has the pleasing effect of scoring app S higher than app Q, for which we have very limited observations as yet. A well-known alternative to creep rank is a random walk with restart algorithm. The algorithm works on the principle of a particle randomly traversing the edges of the graph. At each step, the particle chooses an edge at random, or with probability alpha jumps to a restart node. For this setting, we designate the restart nodes to be the known set of intimate partner surveillance creepware apps. Apps are scored based on how many visits they receive, with the restart probability biasing the particle's visits to the neighborhood of the known creepware apps. The main factor that biased us against this algorithm was that it wasn't clear how to mitigate the false positives that would inevitably arise due to the preponderance of rare apps in this data set. Having designed the creep rank algorithm, we applied it to app installation data from the year 2017. Four coders examined CreepRank's top 1,000 apps, iteratively developing a creepware taxonomy organized into categories and subcategories. We were happy to see coders achieving high levels of agreement as indicated by Fleiss Kappa statistic of 0.77 for categories and 0.75 for subcategories. We also coded the top 1,000 results for the simpler versions of the creep rank algorithm that I described previously, namely to a single iteration version of the algorithm and to a version of the algorithm that does not include maximum a posteriori estimation using the simpler maximum likelihood estimates instead. We also coded the results produced by random walk with restart, and finally we coded the top 1,000 results for the data set spanning from May 2018 to May 2019. We found that these additional coding efforts did not require any changes to our taxonomy, with all discovered apps fitting cleanly into existing categories. Our algorithm uncovered many varieties of surveillance applications, which was not too surprising given that we seeded the algorithm with surveillance applications to begin with. But it also uncovered a broad ecosystem of creeper applications of many different kinds that we didn't even know existed. Of course, CreepRank is not perfect, and its top 1,000 results included 143 apps that had no creeper-related functionality. It seems feasible that a new algorithm could improve upon CreepRank's results, given that the reasons for which the non-creepware apps appeared in the results were generally very clear. These results were nonetheless a substantial improvement over random rock through start, as more than two-thirds of its top 1,000 results were false positives. Results from the two simpler versions of CreepRank confirmed that incorporating skepticism about rare apps is vital to achieving useful results. CreepRank discovered large quantities of spoofing apps that were both unexpected and scary in their implications for victims. The most prevalent subcategory of spoofing apps are burner phone apps, which add additional phone and SMS lines to an existing device. 
In the intimate partner violence setting, such apps could enable attackers to evade phone number blocking. Other spoofing apps openly advertise use cases that include impersonation and alibi falsification over a variety of communication channels. Meanwhile, image spoofing apps include face swapping apps that have been known to be used to create fake revenge porn. This is an advertisement for a spoofing app that actively encourages its users to damage a victim support network by sending hurtful impersonated messages, either directly to the victim or to the victim's loved ones. Harassment apps constituted another troubling category of creepware, none of which seem to have strong legitimate use cases. We found large numbers of fake surveillance apps, which are intended to give the illusion of an ability to access the victim's phone, location, or social media accounts. As seen on the right, these apps typically advertise as harmless pranks, but it's evident from online comments about these apps that they are used in harmful ways. Another prominent form of harassment apps are SMS bombers, which attackers use to harass victims by causing their phones to ring continually. Though less prevalent, we found several apps that exercise control over victims in a variety of ways, such as by knocking them off of a Wi-Fi network with ARP flooding attacks, or by hiding apps on the victim's device to keep them unaware of the app's presence. While the creativity on display among creepware apps was generally very depressing, it was somewhat comforting to also see ingenuity on the side of app developers and victims in combating creepware. We found several apps designed to mitigate surveillance activity, generally through the incorporation of additional access control mechanisms, such as those provided by Oops AppLock. We also found some apps designed to lessen the impact of harassment apps, such as SMS bombers. To measure change in the creepware ecosystem over time, we contrasted creep rank results over apps installed from May 2018 to May 2019 to results from the year 2017. The overall distribution of apps was largely similar, though there were some notable changes that we highlight with this bar chart. Spoofing apps were down, mostly due to a drop in the number of burner phone apps, while harassment apps also decreased, led by a no drop in the number of fake spying apps, which did not disappear altogether. Control and evasion app counts also decreased, while false positive rates remained about the same. We observed a large shift in the volume and style of social media surveillance apps, while more abundant, these apps were generally less privacy invasive than those observed in 2017, mostly because of improvements to the security posture of WhatsApp. We also noticed a very large increase in the numbers of hacking and pen testing apps. The numbers of thorough surveillance apps did not seem to shift or diminish appreciably, neither did their in privacy invasiveness, though there were far fewer apps that openly advocate use cases pertaining to intimate partner violence. The following is the before and after icon and description of an app that has managed to stay on the Google Play Store by altering its marketing. Nowadays, nearly every surveillance app contains a disclaimer along the following lines. It is illegal to use this surveillance app to secretly spy on an adult. You must inform the owner of the device that you have installed this app on their phone. So reading between the lines, these disclaimers generally make it very clear that the surveillance apps themselves issue no notifications or warnings and that they take no responsibility for bad use of their apps. Our first step towards protecting victims from creepware apps was to deploy CreepRank in Norton Mobile Security, where it's been issuing warnings about surveillance apps since July of 2019. We also reported 1,095 apps to Google, who agreed that 813 of these apps deserve to be banned from the Google Play Store because they violate their policies. Specifically, there are several banned capabilities in their developer program policies that match categories of creepware that we observed, such as surveillance apps, spoofing apps of various kinds, and hacking tools. Interestingly, their policies specifically state that apps cannot hide behind claims that they are intended as harmless pranks, a claim that's very often made by harassment and spoofing apps. Unfortunately, there were several remaining apps with creepware functionality, many of which also had benign dual uses that Google understandably seemed reluctant to ban. A further caveat to this victory is that apps banned by Google may live on indefinitely in third-party app stores, though in a diminished capacity. We're happy to state, however, that many of the most pernicious apps, such as the Spoofdext app, have been banned by Google Play and have subsequently ceased to be supported by their developers. There are several research questions and open problems that require further attention. To begin with, notifying victims of creepware apps sounds easy but is actually very challenging given that the apps are generally installed on the victim's phone by the attacker who typically has access to it and its passcode. An immediate notification, therefore, is likely to go to the attacker rather than to the victim. 
Current mobile security has addressed this by adding delayed notification mechanisms to increase the probability of the warnings going to the right party, but further research is warranted and would be helpful. In addition, victims of surveillance applications and harassment routinely call into customer support centers of security vendors who have generally not been trained to assist victims of domestic violence with safety planning and other vital issues. We're developing trainings for customer support staff at Norton and at other members of the Coalition Against Stalkerware, which has been guided by feedback for advocates for victims of domestic violence. Many of the Creepware apps that we discovered uh, are installed on attacker devices, unfortunately, and it's difficult to envision how we could have effective notifications in this scenario. A final challenge is that even in intimate partner surveillance apps, which have had a spotlight shine on them for some time, appear to be thriving in many cases, largely because United States laws do not hold their developers accountable if they don't ad openly advertise for this use case. Thank you for joining us for this talk. Unfortunately, in the limited amount of time we had here, we're only able to scratch the surface of our findings and we encourage you to take a look at our paper for more details. Thanks again.